Hey everybody, it's Mrs. Otis here at home, and today I'm going to introduce for you the first unit in our Reading 8 class, and that unit is all about nonfiction. So here's our introduction to nonfiction. I'm sure that you've heard about nonfiction before beginning in my class, but just a quick review. Nonfiction is writing that is based on facts, real events, and real people. And that makes it a little bit different than fiction writing. Fiction writers are writing to entertain. They want to make you laugh. They want to make you cry. They want to make you feel deeply. And they want you to be caught up in a world of their own creation. Now, fiction can be realistic. For example, there's a book called The Book Thief, and that was written about World War II. But there are some elements in that book that make it fiction. and just because a book takes place during a historic time period, or even if it features historic characters, like the Abraham Lincoln vampire books, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is real information based on facts. So be careful when you try to distinguish between fiction and nonfiction, especially when looking at novels. Nonfiction writers have a different goal though. They're not writing only to entertain, they're writing to do a few other things like inform, persuade, and instruct you. And they're doing that by stimulating your intellect. And all that means is they're doing that by trying to reach you in your brain. So that rational, logical, reasoning part of your brain is what nonfiction writers are aspiring to reach. You can look at these emojis here. You've got the laughing and crying for your fiction writers. And then you've got the deep thinkers for your nonfiction writers. Now, just to break it down even more simply, we talk about author's purpose all the time. It's either to inform, entertain, or persuade. And fiction writers are essentially writing to entertain. They wanna take you away from the real world and your problems in it and take you to another place. Nonfiction writers are looking at the world around you to inform you about it to persuade you to make a change or think about an issue in a certain way or to instruct your intelligent in your intellect. So they want to make you smarter. They want to inform you about a topic that they think is interesting that you should know more about. Now, when you're looking at nonfiction on its own, there are two different kinds of nonfiction. The first kind are personal and primary sources. And the second kind of nonfiction are references and informational text. As we continue to talk about these two different kinds of nonfiction, our personal and primary sources are going to be colored orange, and our references and informational text sources are going to be colored green. So personal and primary sources are based on facts, but they do include a person's feelings and perspectives and their bias. And if someone has a bias, it usually means they have a preference for one thing over another. References and informational text, on the other hand, are factual and they're verified. And what that means is that they go through a pretty rigorous process of experts in the field, reading over the content, offering critiques, and correcting anything that could be misinformation. And they're intended to be without bias, and they're intended to be reliable. So if they're looking at an issue that maybe is being debated, they'll give you both sides of that debate, and they try to represent those sides evenly. Here are some more specific examples of what a personal or primary source might look like. For instance, if somebody lived through World War II and maybe they were in a concentration camp, for example, like Elie Wiesel in Night, he wrote a memoir about his experience. And so his experience is unique to him and he would share his thoughts and feelings about his experience. But because he lived through such a horrible situation, um, his retelling of his situation would be affected by his feelings. So that is where the emotion and bias comes in. Um, essays can be considered a personal or primary source. Interviews as well, these can be very informative and they can include facts, but because they're coming right from a person and they're essentially sometimes unfiltered, especially if they're a personal diary or memoir, 
Um, you have to also anticipate you're going to be getting the feelings and bias of the person who was involved. And that's particularly true about editorials, which appear in newspapers. But just because an editorial is in a newspaper doesn't mean that it is completely factual. There might be bias in there as well. And social media posts, for sure, we know are often shared with a certain intent or a certain um, position on an issue. Now, references and informational text are a little more straightforward and strictly fact-based. So for instance, if there are records in your town hall or in a place in your town that holds historical records and deeds, that would be considered a reference or informational text. Um, dictionaries, uh, oftentimes documentaries, encyclopedias, a user manual, and printed newspapers are often heavily researched and edited to make sure they contain information that's factual. And sometimes newspapers may misreport. They may misreport something inaccurate or make a mistake. And newspapers will often write and correct those mistakes in future issues. So that's something important to know as well as we move forward. So these two kinds of nonfiction often work together. So for example, a reference book, which we talked about as being a reference informational text, can be, um, will use often firsthand interviews and other kinds of primary sources for information. So for example, if you were going to open a history book, I'm just gonna keep using World War II as an example, you would see information about concentration camps and you would probably see interviews from people who maybe helped liberate them or maybe experienced having to um, be held captive in one of those. And those firsthand interviews help create an accurate account of what those experiences are like. So oftentimes these sources help one another and go hand in hand. Here's another example. Social media posts often comment on news articles and reports. So we know social media is really popular and people have very strong opinions about certain issues in the news. And so they might share those opinions uh, by pointing out very particular news articles or commenting on them online. And there sometimes are situations where these kinds of nonfiction maybe cross or come across a line that becomes blurry. So for instance, some print news and news talk shows will sometimes leak their bias and feelings into their reporting. So we know there are many TV shows that are 24 hour news cycles where you see news all day and they bring professional commentators on. The people who are leading the discussion are professionals at providing commentary and insight. And sometimes we trust these uh, TV productions as uh, truthful and unbiased news sources, but uh, we'll learn how to identify bias um, in nonfiction. So that's something to also be aware of. And blogs and social media posts, even though sometimes people discredit them completely, there are situations where there can be facts reported through social media. And I'm gonna give you two examples, and they're both from TikTok. Here's our first nonfiction text from TikTok. Don't know what you're saying. You're flying higher than a plane, and I'm not complaining. It's getting too loud, we'll figure it out. I'm out of my brain. So TikTok, I think, is a great resource. And one of the things that I like about it are the recipe videos. This would definitely be considered a nonfiction text, even though it's a video, because you're seeing uh, an account of someone create a recipe. A recipe is a nonfiction text. It's a set of instructions. And this is something that, you know, can improve your cooking skills and um, maybe spark something intellectually and get you more interested in culinary arts. Here's a second example of a different nonfiction text from TikTok. I'll turn up the volume here for this one. Do you 
got the time to listen to me whine. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. We are ones, we are born from Father to me and to the city. Everything's gonna be alright, yeah. Everything's gonna be alright. So that's another fun TikTok this time. You're not looking at a recipe, but you're seeing a comparison of popular songs to Canon and D minor. I think it's, well, it's just Canon and D. And you're able to see how these songs all share similarities in their progression. And that's a pretty valuable nonfiction text. It activates your mind intellectually and it helps draw comparisons and contrasts and something you might be interested in. And so that would be a significant nonfiction text, but it appears on social media. Now, here are some hints and tips uh, as we begin approaching nonfiction texts, things that will help you understand what you will read and see. The first thing to talk about are headings and subheadings. Both of these headings and subheadings can help guide your reading. And here's a pro tip for approaching nonfiction. You should skim the page before reading to look at the headings, subheadings, and captions. That way you get an idea of how the text is organized and you can kind of anticipate then how the information will be presented to you. You should also pay attention to bolded, underlined, and italicized words. These usually show you key terminology that is maybe unique to a subject area or identify vocabulary words in a text that you're reading. Usually these uh, hints are clues from the author that this is something important and worth paying attention to. So let's look at the headings example here. This is a, a link I put in the presentation. Here are two examples of what headings look like from Scholastic Scope Magazine. This heading here appears at the beginning of an article and gives you important background on the text you're about to read. And this heading appears over uh, an editorial, which is an opinion letter, and it helps you know the point of view of the author before you begin reading the letter they're writing about sharing passwords. And let's look at four other features of nonfiction texts that will help you better understand the text you're going to read. The first term is the word glossary, and a glossary defines vocabulary words. You can use glossaries to learn and understand new words. Let's click here, and this gives you an example of a glossary. This is most likely from a science book, potentially biology, and here you're learning all about um, different parts of insects, and you're seeing the definitions of the bolded vocabulary terms. So a glossary is very helpful when you're trying to understand maybe the general idea of a chapter um, or the main idea of a text, but also maybe help practice those very specific and particular keywords. Our next word is a diagram. Diagrams illustrate concepts using pictures. So when concepts are kind of complicated, whether it's photosynthesis or the Industrial Revolution, a diagram with pictures and directional arrows and features can help you break down a complicated topic. Let's look at our example here. We have a diagram that helps explain gravity and the way that gravity works. So this is a pretty simplistic diagram, but you can notice there are directional features like arrows. There are terms to help show the relationship between ideas. And there are images to represent, you know, the earth and also the moon and the axis upon which, you know, the moon is moving. Our third term important for nonfiction is caption. Captions are found under pictures, diagrams, and other text features. Let's click here. This is a beautiful draft, and alongside of it, we have a caption. It says figure one, and figure one, I'm sure, probably appears down here. I, I'm thinking I cropped it out, but it will tell you all about the animal in the image and give you um, important information that the author wants to, you to know about that animal. And finally, the last word is index. 
An index can be found in the back of a text and it's used to locate topics with their page numbers. So for instance, maybe you have a very large physics book and something that you are trying to learn more about is um, propulsion. And so you would look in your physics book in the index for any words that relate to um, speed or propulsion and that would help you find the right chapter to get more information. Here's an example of an index. So this is, I think, from probably an instruction manual for maybe a telephone because we have some ideas about installation, about um, internet, about directories, and cordless telephone style type, etc. But you can see it's organized alphabetically by topic and the numbers tell you what pages to find the topic on. So for instance, if you're looking for more information about a call log, you could look at page 22 or page 37 to find more information. So folks, that gives you an idea of some of the key concepts of nonfiction text. So I hope that you found the images helpful and that this was maybe more of a review of things that you've learned in the past. Thanks for watching.